You're listening to the Beer Mile Podcast. Leading into the Chicago Marathon, we uh, caught up with a number of different uh, guys, I guess, just guys that were racing and saw where their head was at and where their training was at leading into the race. And so it was kind of interesting to see how some of those played out, you know, some doing exactly what they said to plan, um, some maybe not having as great a day as they had hoped, but, um, you know, so now continuing on this series, I guess, of, you know, Chicago marathon kind of being a theme and post race at this point, uh, excited to, to chat with you and kind of hear about, how the how your training cycle went leading into it, kind of what your expectations were, and then where you ultimately landed. So, so maybe we we start there. Just what was the plan going into uh, the race this past weekend? Yeah. So uh, the plan was to was to get out there and just go for it. Um, you know, I haven't run a PR in the marathon since 2017, uh, back in London when I ran 225. So it's been a long time coming. Um, a lot of my marathon builds, I've struggled staying healthy. Uh, and so there's always been significant interruptions, um, and how I've been able to prepare for the ones that I've done since London. Um, and so I just feel like I've never quite had the shot. Like I've never quite put the build up together to really give myself every opportunity to go out there and just like hit it out of the park. Um, you know, I know I'm, I'm capable of that. I know 225 isn't all I have to offer. Uh, so anyway, it's just kind of been a long time coming and it's just kind of been trying to find the right race, uh, praying to the marathon gods that you have the right day (laughs) to just execute that type of race. Um, and so, yeah, going into Chicago, you know, I did something I, never done before. I stayed healthy for the entire block. Um, I overtrained a little bit, probably like seven weeks out or so I raced Falmouth. Um, Mm -hmm. and then like an idiot decided to do a 10 mile cool down, like directly after the race. (laughs) And, um, that was probably just a little too much. I mean, cause marathon training is all about finding that line and just riding it right. As long as you can, without going either way off of it. <clears throat> so I think I kind of overstepped a little bit, just trying to kind of, I just got ahead of myself, you know, uh, thinking that I had to just keep putting the mileage in. Um, but outside of that, I didn't miss a day of running. I was able to run every single day in this block. Uh, so going into the race, you know, I, I was healthy. I felt excited. I just, you know, the weather looked great. It's Chicago. It's flat. It's fast. Um, mm-hmm. I put together a pace group for myself. Um, just again, I set up the day, uh, to go out there and, and swing big and hopefully hit it out of the park. Um, so yeah, the prep was great. My mindset going into it was great. Um, I was excited. I just felt like this was the marathon, um, to kind of just put it all together finally. Uh, so anyway, yeah, the, um, that's kind of where I was headed into, into the race last week. Yeah. So then, yeah, I know you said on your, on your Insta post afterwards that, yeah, you were going for that 223 mark, uh, mm-hmm. going for the PR felt like ready to do it. And pretty early on, you said you felt like something was off, like it wasn't like a hundred percent there. So when was that point in the race where you thought maybe things weren't going as well, or you didn't feel quite as well as you thought you should at that point in the race? Yeah. 10 K. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's pretty early. Unfortunately, early. Yeah. you got 20 miles to go. Yep. Um, so yeah, around 10 K I just felt off. Um, I don't, I don't really know how to explain that. I just felt like I was already stressed. Like I was just already kind of reaching deep within the well to hit the pace. Um, which is obviously not how you want to feel at 10 K. Yeah. Uh, I knew it was going to be hard. I mean, running, 223 running a PR in the marathon, uh, whatever that might be for you, you know, it's going to be hard. You know, you're going to have to hurt and go into that well to be able to do something you've never done. But in the marathon, you, you want to feel a certain like relaxedness kind of, uh, in those early stages, like, yes, you're working and you can feel that you're working, but like you're in that rhythm. You're just kind of, you feel one with your body. You just kind of have that feeling at least around, like hopefully up until around 19, 20 miles. And then obviously those last six, you're digging with whatever you have. Um, so at 10 K to feel as stressed and as just off as I felt was alarming. Um, so I made the decision at that point to back off, um, the two twenty three and kind of settle into maybe more like two twenty five. 
Um, yeah. <clears throat> and I thought maybe just taking the pedal off the gas, just to kind of try and relax a little bit and find more of that rhythm would be helpful. Um, I just, I still didn't feel like that felt hard. Um, so I, I somehow managed to get to halfway around 225. I think we went through in like 72 mid. Um, and then the last 13 <laughs> was just a mess. I, yeah, I don't know. I just felt tight. I felt tense. I felt like, I, like everything was like holding. Um, I just couldn't get my body to do what I needed it to do. So at that point, you know, the PR is slowly fading. That top finish is slowly fading. So I was just, you know, you're just fighting to the finish. Um, that was like, you know, it was all I could do. Uh, so mm-hmm. it, it was a pretty day given like what I just said earlier that, you know, the prep had gone well. Um, I was healthy. Uh, I felt like I was in a really good, uh, situation with my coach and like the team that I, that I kind of transitioned into at the beginning of the year. Um, yeah, I felt like, you know, the weather was great. Uh, Chicago was great and kind of put resources into me to like really allow me to have this day. Uh, and it just wasn't there. It just wasn't there. Uh, so, you know, that's, this sport is so freaking hard because sometimes, that that's what happens. You don't have like an answer. Um, it's just not there on the day that you're really hoping it to be there. And sometimes those days are on the world's biggest stages and every athlete has been through it. Every athlete has experienced something similar to that. Um, and you know, I think the more time that elapses, um, I'll have a little bit more of those answers. And I think I'll really learn from this experience. Um, and I have a lot that I'm still really proud of. Um, anytime yeah. you finish a marathon, I think that's a huge <laughs> achievement, uh, especially on the tough days when you're just having to grind from such a far way out. Um, it's easy to throw in the towel. So I was proud of myself that I didn't do that, even though I wanted <laughs> to yeah. do that at like several different what, points. Was that, uh, <laughs> the decision to finish the race, is that more about pride and wanting to finish it? Or is there like a financial incentive as well that kind of forces you to, to push through and finish the race? I think for me, it's just about like who I believe myself to be. Um, I'm not someone that quits. Um, I've dropped out of one marathon, um, and that was due to an injury, Um, and I promised myself, like, I mean, when you're injured, you obviously like, there's only so much you can do. And that was definitely the right decision for me to make, um, running 26 miles on an injury was not, um, was not my best interest. Um, but outside of that, I just feel like I have to fight and I have to finish the day. Like I owe it to myself. I owe it to like my sponsors. I owe it to the people that believe in me. Like I owe it to the race, like, even if I'm not going to have the day that I've prepared for and that I've hoped for, um, I've still put so much work into this race. I put, I've sacrificed so much for this one day. Um, and I just feel like I would, I'd be cheating myself out of fighting through, even though it's not going well, I think it's a slippery slope when you start dropping out of races. Um, so for me, Uh, I just felt that there is pride in finishing and there's pride in finishing what you started, even if it's not the day that you're, even if it's not going to be that perfect day. Um, I just, and also I, I think you get a lot from the days that are really tough and hard. Um, you get a lot from fighting through those days. Um, and maybe in the moment you don't know what that is, but later on, I know I'm going to be better for finishing that race. I know I'm going to be better for pushing through and believing in myself and fighting to that finish line. Um, I'm still going to get so much from that. And so again, there was just so many reasons to finish, but I just pride myself and regardless of the day I'm having to fight through and to get to that finish line. I think for me as an athlete, um, it just means a lot for me to, for me to do that. That's just who I believe I am, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So. I, li- I mean, I like that mindset and unfortunately in, in running, mm-hmm. um, I guess really you're, if you're dedicating a lot of hours to anything you have, most of the days are just kind of neutral or even, you know, mm-hmm. tough, not 
super like you only have those few days that really come by <laughs> where you're just flowing and you're cruising tempo pace and it's like chill and yep. it's easy. And, and it really does make you appreciate those days if you gut it out on all the hard days, uh, because you, yeah, you realize how tough it can be. And then the good days feel that much better. So I think there's, Agreed. there's absolutely something to get gutting it out. And then now in your next race, you know, it's, it's going to feel great manifest that now. And it's just going to yes, be exactly. like night and day difference. You're going to run like 10 minutes faster and you're going to feel better <laughs> doing it. So. <laughs> I hope so. That's the plan. Um, so yeah, again, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, sets me up for that. Um, sometimes, you know, you have your, your hardest days, uh, right before you have those breakthroughs. Sometimes that's just how the sport goes. Um, so that's what I'm obviously going to try and manifest and believe, uh, as far as what I'm going to get from what happened on Sunday. Definitely. So right now, then are you just taking some time mm -hmm. to decompress, chill out? What's the, what's the post cycle plan, uh, for these, at least for these couple of weeks of, uh, relaxation before getting back into it? Yeah, I'm just trying to take a break. Um, I always take two weeks after a marathon where I just, for me, I think not only like physically do I do I feel like I kind of need that rest so my body can kind of like reset itself. Um, but just emotionally and psychologically, again, you pour so much of yourself into your build and into the race itself that I always need a little bit of time to decompress um, and just kind of slowly come off of it regardless of the day. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take, um, at least this week of no running, um, and then probably try and do some jogging every other day next week. Um, but yeah, just trying to kind of, I, I think breaks are a great time to kind of like remove yourself from your identity as a runner, yeah. uh, and kind of embrace that balance back into your life and just be like, I am more than just what I do as an athlete, you know, I have all these other things going for me. I have all these other things that I can now put a little bit more time and energy into, um, and just kind of trying to, uh, bring some of that back into your life. And just remember that, you know, again, we're not, we're not just defined by what we do, um, out on the race course. So Definitely. I use my break for all of that as well. Um, so I'm going to get out of town next week, um, do a little, little vacation, try and kind of use that time to decompress a little bit more, um, getting out of Boulder, getting out of just like the routine that I have here is also really nice to just do something completely different to help take yourself out of that as well. So, um, that's kind of the plan. I'm going to go sit on a beach, uh, there we go. just kind of chill, <laughs> yep. Um, yep. drink some pina coladas, you know, just live the dream a little bit, try and thrive in like a whole different way <laughs> and then come yes. back and kind of like reassess like what the next, what the next step is. So <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. It, I, do, do you feel like you're someone who like <clears throat> the kind of the, the weight off your shoulders at the end of the season just feels like so relieving or cause I, cause I, I, I know there's kind of both personalities of runners where some are just like, can't stand to chill out. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, I have to start working out right away. Like I'm getting so out of shape in these two weeks that I'm taking off. There's like that personality. And then there's also those who can really just let themselves go and enjoy it. Just be like, this is like my two week cheat time. I do whatever I want, whenever I want. And then I'll focus again. Uh, do you think yeah. you're, which one are you personality aligns more to, to your life? And, uh, yeah, I'm what, definitely, what you believe in. <laughs> I'm definitely the second one. Um, I'm really yeah. good at chilling out. Um, like I'm what four days into my break and I have no desire to go for a run. Like I don't want anything to do with yeah. running. I just want to completely check out. Um, and so, yeah, it's funny. I have friends that, you know, they take like two or three days and they're like, Oh man, like, don't I'm you itching. just start to go? Yeah. yeah. Like, don't you just start to go stir crazy? Like, aren't you just ready to like get back out there? And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> I'm really good at like taking the full two weeks by the end of the second week. Uh, you're kind of like that desire kind of comes back and you are kind of like itching to like put up new goals and kind of like start planning out like what the next chunk is going to look like. And you're kind of fired up and, you know, um, but it takes me almost two weeks before I've like arrived at that point. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy the break. I enjoy just like decompressing, checking out, um, not thinking about running. Like, I think for me, that's a big part of why I've continued, like why I have the career that I've had. Um, and it really helps me not burn myself out. 
um, by taking these breaks. So yeah, I'm really good at just chilling out. And I'm also someone that like loves the taper. I know a lot of people don't like tapering <laughs> yeah. for like the same reason. And I'm like, oh no, I'm like, I love the last two weeks of a marathon build where you're just kind of like chilling out and you're starting to come up and like feel good. Like I'm really good at resting. I didn't used to be that way, but I am now at this stage of my career. So yeah, I'm a great yeah. break taker. <laughs> That's good. I think it's super, super important uh, to be able to do that. The, the mm -hmm. mental piece of it is, you know, maybe even more than the physical piece of it. So to yeah, be able to actually to allow yourself to do that and be confident in your ability that you're not going to get out of shape in the last two weeks if you only run, you know, 60 miles a week instead of whatever you're yeah. running before. Like, you're still going to be yeah. fine. You're going to be better for it. So <laughs> well, I always say, like, I told my friend this recently, like, you're, it feels like you've lost everything in those two weeks, but like, really it's like your fitness is just like hibernating and mm -hmm. you just need like another, like two or three weeks kind of back into things. And like, it all comes back. Like you're really not losing as much as you feel like you're losing. Um, so I always try and tell myself that too. Like you're obviously losing some, but like you're, you're not losing everything. Uh, and so again, it's just like, it's important, I think just to kind of let your body chill out and to just yeah. like, celebrate all the hard work you put in, um, like the training again, the race, regardless of how it goes, like that's a ton of work. It's a ton of emotional and psychological stress. That's a lot of physical stress. Like you have to let yourself just kind of come down from that and, and celebrate yeah. that. So you can kind of close it out and then go into the next thing. Definitely have to absorb it and recover in order to, uh, have to. go up, up yeah. another rung on the ladder. I, I had a coach, uh, a few years ago that I always, it was like the first time I ever really thought about training this way. But, uh, I was in a phase where I was like, I'm going to run hundred miles a week every week. And I'm either going to break or I'm going to be in the best shape of my life for this marathon. <laughs> and he was like, well, if you want to be in the best shape for this current marathon, you probably don't want to do super high mileage. Like that you do high mileage and all that training this season to absorb it for the next season. Um, right. and you're always compounding these seasons versus, uh, like you get super motivated and you're like, I'm going to grind this one 12 week cycle as hard as I can, which yeah, you know, that you obviously got to do that too. But, but also sometimes it takes a while for those results to come and you have to actually absorb it, recover from it. And then it's maybe two or three cycles later where you actually redeem the benefits from that. Yep. And sometimes you're just 100%. too tired up front, uh, you know, from that cycle to, to really put it into a, a performance. So after that, I started thinking about <laughs> training, a <laughs> kind of a whole lot differently where then, yeah, like that two week break <laughs> at the end of the season, I'm like, wow, I'm finally going to absorb all, all that hard work that exactly. I did. And, Tore yeah, myself down. To like, yeah, you have yeah. to let yourself absorb it. And again, yeah, it's just like you're laying base after base after base. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, what you're doing for one 12 week cycle, sometimes, yeah, you see that benefit like, like for the next one. It's not always like immediate, which again, this is a sport of patience. Yes. Uh, and it's so hard to be patient because you want those results immediately. Um, but more times than not, that's not how it happens. And you just have to trust that, like, you're going to reap the benefits, but it may not be exactly when you want it. So that's what I'm telling myself uh, with this last one is I did my first un uninterrupted block of training. Uh, I didn't see the results from that that I wanted in Chicago, but I, I really hope and believe that I am going to see the results of that for the next one. I just have to tr keep trusting it and be patient. But Absolutely. man, is it hard in like the immediate aftermath, you just question everything. <laughs> um so, I mean, yeah, that's a sport, right? It's so frustrating it and heartbreaking sometimes. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely <laughs> is. So, so have you thought much about what the upcoming races are that, especially looking at, you know, 2024 Olympic trials being, you know, early in the year in 2024, it's really, you know, just over a year away. So do, have you thought about kind of what you want to focus on for racing in 23 leading into that? Or are you letting that come after this, this break, uh, that you're taking right now? Do you want 20% off on award-winning brews? Use our code BEERMILE20, that's BEERMILE20, all one word at athleticbrewing.com to get 20% off your entire order today. With Athletic Brewing's non-alcoholic craft beers, you can drink guilt-free without the hangover. Give it a try. BEERMILE20, all one word, BEERMILE20 at athleticbrewing.com for 20% off. Cheers. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously I, I need another marathon. Um, so I'm trying to figure out like what that looks like. And yeah, with the trials most likely being early in 2024, um, you do kind of have to think about like how late in the fall are you willing to do one and come off of it and then be prepared for um, that January or February race. Um, ideally, 
I would love to do a spring marathon. Um, that was my thought before Chicago, uh, was to do Chicago, obviously have a bit of a different outcome. Um, and I've, ne- I've never done Boston. Um, and so I planned like two years ago that Boston 2023 was kind of would fit really well into mm-hmm. like my overall plan. Um, and it would be a great year to finally just take that one off. Um, I would love to still do that. Obviously, there's a lot of moving pieces with that. Um, and I'm, you know, disappointed with my performance in Chicago. Um, and I don't know how much weight that's going to carry as I look at what I'm going to do next. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ideally, Boston um, would be would be where like, that's kind of where my heart is. That's the one I would really like to do. Um, and kind of use that as like my hit out for the trials. Um yeah. But yeah, we'll just see, you know, um, obviously I feel like now I still have all this unfinished business with Chicago. Uh, so, you know, that one's early enough where, um, I did that in 2019 and then I did Atlanta in 2020. Um, and that was, uh, I was, that was an easy turnaround. So I don't know, you know, um, I'm not so sure what next year is going to look like. Uh, but yeah, I'll definitely have one or two marathons in there. I'm just not sure which ones. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of see. And like right now, the thought of a marathon, you're like, Oh dear God, (laughs) (laughs) I need to like forget still. Like it's too soon. I remember too much from Sunday. It was so dark. (laughs) Yeah. Get over Um, the trauma for a little bit. Forget how painful it was. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so traumatized right now that I'm like, Oh God, like, can I do another marathon? Like, I don't know. You know, like you're questioning like everything, but, um, yeah, ideally Boston, but you know, we'll just have to see how that looks. But yeah. Do you, do you think that you're more, (laughs) interested in or do, do you like the flatter courses more where you're running for times or do you like a course like Boston where it's like less about time just about placing and competing yeah I'm definitely more of that type of athlete um like I I love New York um I obviously yeah. loved Atlanta I'm probably one of the very few that liked Atlanta yeah um, I was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> uh the harder the better for me I definitely think I'm more of a strength runner um I'm, I love the grind and I love the simple aspect of you're competing and you're just racing the race as opposed to chasing the time. So that's kind of also what I'm trying to reflect on, like looking at this last weekend. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself, uh, to just like run these splits and to chase a time on the clock, which in years past just doesn't really work for me. Um, so I think getting back to a race where you're just racing the race and you're racing the women in the race. And obviously like you want a time to come with that, but my best times have come when I'm just doing that. It's why I love New York. Um, it's why I liked Atlanta. Like I love the simplicity of that, which is, it's like cross country, you know, like that's my, that's my love. Um, because it's just so simple. You're not necessarily chasing that clock all the time. So I think that's why I'm drawn to Boston is because it's like a New York where it's just so challenging and then you you don't have pacers. You're just racing the women that are there and you're trying to survive the course. Um, that's more of who I am as an athlete. So I think that's a course I'd like to get back to. Um, and I think that's where I run my best is when I'm doing that. So. Definitely. Definitely. Everyone loves to see a sexy time on paper, but the reality is the the team is picked by, (laughs) you know, placing top three and it's all about competing to actually make teams. So yeah, if, if that's your preference or if that's where you feel you would do better, I I'd probably take that over the the time trialing. Although it is, it is nice to have a a sexy PR next to your name too. I guess there's both sides of it. And that's what I, that's what I like made. Like that was the goal for the year was to like get that sexy PR. Um, And so I had to give it a shot. Uh, And, you know, a Chicago was definitely where I thought I would have my best shot to do it. Didn't happen. Um, So, yeah, you're just going back to the basics and you're just going back to like who you are as an athlete and what you really love um, to do. And like kind of like I think Des said it best once someone asked her why she wasn't running the marathon project. And she kind of laughed and she was like, because I know my strengths as an athlete and this course and this like the way it's set up is not doesn't play to my strengths. Um, and I really, I thought about that and I was like, Oh, that's so true. And so I think at this point, I just need to kind of go back to like, what are your strengths? What do you truly love? Like what brings the best out of you? And it's, it's, it's things like that. And so I think it's maybe time to just go back to that. Um, 
and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. You mentioned the love for cross country, the strength over the hills and everything. And I mean, growing up yeah. in Colorado, I'm not totally shocked, you know, living at altitude, <laughs> running, running in the mountains, all that sort of stuff. So how, I guess going, going way back to growing up, like how did, how was training like in, uh, you grew up in Durango and then went to Boulder. So it, were you running a lot of hills and trails and that sort of thing growing up? Or were you still like pretty focused on track and roads, even, you know, training growing up? I'm curious how, how that's like actually living in the mountains themselves, what the, what the training looks like, especially for, you know, cross country as a, an up and coming runner. Yeah. Um, I hated track as a high school athlete. I actually, um, I didn't find running until I stumbled into cross country, having gotten cut from like every other sport. Um, and cross country is a non-cut sport, like everyone yep. can participate. <laughs> so I kind of found my way into cross country, like because of that. Um, but I fell in love with it because yeah, I, you know, I grew up running trails behind my house with my dad. Um, like that's what I trained on. I didn't train on the roads. I, you know, I didn't love track. Um, I did track to become better at cross country. Um, I liked the Hills. I liked just, again, the simplicity of you're racing the conditions and you're racing the, your components, but you're not necessarily chasing this time on a clock. Like I just love the purity of that because I really think that's what running boils down to at the end of the day. It's this very freeing thing that I think people kind of fall in love with and get addicted to because of that simplicity that you have with that. So yeah, I grew up doing exactly that. I grew up running trails. Um, and so that's kind of how I found my way into the sport. Um, which is why I always kind of come back to that when I'm struggling um, just going out for a run on the trail. Like you don't have your Garmin on, you don't have like a GPS, like, you're just running in the mountains. You're just running dirt roads in the mountains. You're just running single track trail, like through like the flat irons, like, or going home and running like my favorite childhood trails. Like that's always how I recenter myself and kind of how I get my why back when I feel like I'm kind of losing that. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of that is because that's how I grew up. Um, and that's how I kind of found my way into the sport. Yeah. And do you see yourself moving into trail racing at any point yeah, no. or is it more just a passion, just a passion that you enjoy, it's, but not a yeah, competition it's more piece? Of just a passion. I look at what, uh, the athletes in the trail world do. <laughs> I don't think I could do that. I think me <laughs> racing on trails would be like a hot mess. Like I'd be a disaster. Um, but I love training on the trails and the trails will always hold a really special place to me because like I said, that's how I grew up and that's how I kind of found my way into the sport. I think racing and competing on that type of terrain and doing what those guys do is a completely different world. And I don't necessarily see myself doing that. Um, I think that's why I like the trails is because when I'm on the trails, I'm not thinking about competing. Yeah. I'm not thinking about racing. I'm not thinking about all these things that come with what we do as, as athletes. I'm just running because it's freeing and I love to run, you know? And so I think that's part of why I'd, I don't want to race on the trails because I don't want to lose what the trails really are to me, which is just, it's away from all of that stuff. Uh, and it's a way to kind of center myself when I need that. Makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. And we, so we, we have a, uh, quite a few listeners that are, I'd say a lot of listeners kind of college age runners as well. Uh, and you know, one thing I wanted to make sure to talk to you about was the transition from college running to, you know, to professional running and kind of what that looked like for you. And like in college, did you foresee yourself being a professional runner at some point, uh, or did, did you intend to just continue on with it, you know, on your own accord? And then when did that actual, you know, that first pro deal come and kind of what did that, that story look like for you coming out of college? Yeah, I, um, college was tough for me. I had a really, uh, challenging time, I think adjusting to the intensity level that comes with collegiate running, uh, the mileage, um, and then just kind of like that psychological component of trying to figure out like where you, like where you belong within like the realm of all of that. Um, I, you know, I was like, I think like most collegiate athletes, like I was, I was the best one on my team in high school. Um, I trained very low mileage. Um, I like had success doing that. And then coming to college where suddenly you're on a team with like 40 foot locker finalists and state champions and Nike cross champions. And like, 
you know, suddenly you're like in like a small fish in a big pond, um, adjusting to that. And then, um, yeah, I was just, you know, I didn't, I didn't really understand, um, the fact that because I was running more mileage and doing really intense workouts that I needed to recover. So I wasn't using my recovery days accurately. I was running way too hard all the time. I thought I had to prove myself in every workout or every long run. Um, so I was, I was just overtraining. I was getting hurt because I couldn't quite figure out that rest, like work balance with the running. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you're away from home, you're trying to adjust to living on your own. Um, college was just hard. Uh, I was taking some bad shortcuts thinking that that would help me become better in college. Um, and I was getting injured because of that. So I, I really struggled my first three years in college to kind of like figure out the appropriate balance for myself, uh, and communicating that to my coaches. Um, so I came out of college a little burned out. Um, you know, you go in like thinking, you know, you have all these goals for yourself. I wanted to, you know, be all American. I wanted to make track nationals. I wanted to like, you know, be top 10 at nationals. I wanted to like have a school record or, you know, like you have all these goals and I came out of college, not having done a single one of those. Yeah, um, yep. and so, yeah, I definitely didn't think professional running was in the cards for me. I had the very limited view that the only way you could be a professional runner where it was, you had to sign a huge contract right out of college, mm -hmm. um, and kind of be recruited by running companies and by agents. And if that wasn't happening for you, then like there's no way that you could like break into that world. I had no understanding that there's obviously a thousand different ways to approach that. Um, and I was just burned out. Um, I was disappointed that I didn't have a collegiate career that I thought I was going to have. Um, I learned so much in college though. I learned so many lessons that I was actually able to kind of take out and then eventually put towards a professional career. So I'm so grateful for the four years I had at CU, even though they were some of the hardest four years yeah. <laughs> probably of my career. Um, but it's kind of where you learn how to like adapt and adjust and how to communicate and what you really need as an athlete. Um, so yeah, I came out of college. I took three months off. I didn't run a step, um, was looking for jobs, was trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do. Um, I started coaching. I started, um, I was an assistant cross country coach at a, at a local high school. I got hired to do that. So that's kind of how I got back into running so I could run with the girls. Um, and then, yeah, I, uh, one of my old teammates at CU had joined a local track club and was like, Hey, like, I don't think you're finished yet. I don't think you're done. Like, I think you just need a different environment. And I think you can take everything that you learned at CU and kind of put it towards like this next phase, whatever that is. Um, and up until then, I had never really thought that I didn't know there were track clubs for people. I didn't know there were groups for like, you know, people that were still trying to run to whatever level outside of college. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I fell in with the Boulder track club. Um, and yeah, I just started slowly getting back into training. My coach at the time was like, just, just remember why you do it. Like, just get back into running for yourself. Um, and whatever that looks like, you know, uh, so I started doing some local races, um, kind of got that fire back. Um, and so I, you know, I started entering into like club cross country and like some U S cross country races and, um, just slowly kind of started putting some performances on the board, slowly started to see some PRs on the track. Um, but it wasn't, so I graduated in 2011 and I didn't sign my first professional contract until 2014. So I was working two jobs. Um, I was working at a running store full time. I was coaching and then I was training with this track club. Um, wow. And I just chipped away for, you know, those three and a half years, um, just slowly getting better, slowly kind of finding my confidence again, um, slowly kind of just falling in love with the sport all over again and realizing that there's this whole other world outside of collegiate athletics. And again, in college, I had such a limited view. I thought once you were done with college, unless you signed a huge deal and we're going to like go to the Olympics, that was it. Like you couldn't keep running. And so if I had any piece of advice for collegiate athletes listening the four or five years you spend in college, like you are just getting started. Like that is not yeah. the end of your journey. Like if you want to keep running out of college, but you're not signing some big pro deal or you're not signing with an agency, like there are so many ways to do that. There are so many races. There are so many like, 
different avenues that you can take. And college is such a small chapter in the overall story. Um, but I just didn't know that any of that existed out there if you weren't like a big superstar in college. Um, and yeah. I wasn't like I was never an all American at CU. I never made track nationals. Um, but you know, like here I am, you know, like 18 years into my running career and I'm blessed enough to still be doing this. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, there are so many different ways to get somewhere. Uh, it's not like one way or like you have to be done. Absolutely. It's, it's unfortunate. It does seem like a lot of college athletes, uh, do, well, maybe it's not that they don't know what the options are afterwards. Maybe they just truly are burned out because, you know, D1 yeah. running is hard. Um, uh, but, yeah. but it is, it's always, you know, crazy to me, like looking at, uh, like I'm still very involved in the Chicago running scene, running clubs, et cetera. And it's like a lot of the people who are still, you know, PR and getting better up to, you know, 30 years old after 30 years old, kind of at that amateur sub elite level. A lot of them are not people who are amazing in college. They're, they're mostly people who just kept at it and just have a love for yeah. doing it. And a lot of the people mm -hmm. that graduate, you know, D one and they're, you know, whatever, if they're a guy, they're maybe like a sub 14, five K guy. Uh, um, they're still very solid or a sub 16, uh, woman for, you know, on the women's side, and it's like, where do they all go? They just like stop yeah. running and, and give up. And it's, it's so sad because it really should be a ideally a healthy relationship with running that you love and you just want to keep doing it because you love the sport. And then, you know, if you PR off of that and continue to get better then great, you can keep running with it. But, um, it does seem like that, that, uh, relationship with the, the sport and just having that inner motivation and inner love for it is really what drives, you know, success and sticking with it, uh, you know, versus, yeah, a lot, a lot of people just, it's like D1, you go all in. And if you, if you get the big deal, you get the big deal. And if not, a lot, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of athletes just kind of get burned out at that point And they, they, they never really make it back to that same level of passion that they had, you know, before. Yeah. I think the collegiate system is just so hard because it's so intense and it's like, cross country, indoor, outdoor. And it's just like, it's nonstop just four yeah. or five years of just nonstop going. Um, and I think it's really easy, especially in this day and age with like social platforms, um, to compare yourself. And again, to think that like, well, I have to be doing what she's doing, or I have to be doing what he's doing, mm -hmm. or I have to train like she's training, or I, you know, if I'm not winning this, then like, I'm not good enough. Or if I don't look like that, then you know, I'm not going to have the success that they're having. And so it's such an intense environment. And so again, if anything, if I learned anything is like, put the blinders on. And again, just remember, even in that intense system, like your the way that you get somewhere doesn't have to look like anyone else's and comparing yourself to other people is just like, that was something that I really struggled with myself and got I got into trouble doing that. Um, And so when I came out of college, I kind of like, reset myself. And I kind of was like in this environment where again, you're with people that are out there because they just want to be out there and they just love the sport. And they're just trying to see how far they can go and just push their own limits. Um, that was so refreshing to remember that like, that's how I started. And that's what it used to be. And I just lost that in college thinking that I had to look like someone else, or I had to be you know, having the success someone else was having. Mm -hmm. And you think you have to do it all in that four year span. Um, but you don't like, again, this is a sport of patience and you, you know, you have so like, you're just getting started in college. And I just wish someone would have, would have told me that I think I could have enjoyed my collegiate experience a lot more had I had that perspective. And I just didn't, you know, um, it took me college to kind of learn that, uh, and then apply that now. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, it can be, it can be tough, but there's so many resources outside of that system that are there for people that want to keep going. And, um, that's the cool thing about the sport is you can keep going, you know, you don't, there's nothing that you have to have or not have to, to do that. So that's what makes Absolutely. running, I think so cool. Definitely. Definitely. So now, uh, looking at your situation then today, uh, who, who are you training with? Are you, do you have partners that are doing some of these big training workouts with you? And I know for, uh, for a while you were self-coached, uh, what is your current coaching situation as well? Do you want the sickest shades in the game at an affordable price? Look no further than knock around sunglasses, knockaround.com. Use our code BEERMILEPOD. That's all one word, BEERMILEPOD for 20% off your entire order. 
These babies are super sick. I'm wearing the Mary Janes right now if you're watching on the video version. They look good running, look good casual, very durable, and like I said, at an affordable price. Really the best all-around sunglasses out there. Head on over to knockaround.com and use our code BEERMILEPOD, all one word, for 20% off. Yeah, I self-coached myself um, last fall for New York um, after I uh, made the transition out of Team Boss. Um, and then, yeah, so at the beginning of this year, I ended up joining forces with Steve Jones. Um, and for those of you listening, if you don't know Steve Jones, he's a Welshman. And he used to hold the world record in the marathon. Um, he won Chicago, New York, London, Toronto. Um, so anyway, he's a, he's a legend uh, in the sport, especially at, uh, at the marathon distance. So yep. he has a small group here in Boulder. Um, a lot of the group... Um, they're, you know, they're, they have full-time jobs, they have families, their parents, you know, they have all these other things going for them. Um, and they're out there running again, because they love the sport and they're trying to see how far they can push their own, their own limits. And they still have goals for themselves, but they're out there every day because they just love to be out there and they just love the sport and still want to be part of that. Um, so it's been a really fun environment to kind of settle into because it's a good reminder for me that yes I do this as my job um but sometimes I can take it too seriously and I can get so like just like one like lane focused um and I can kind of lose why I'm out here um and I can kind of lose that perspective of like you're out here because you love to run um and yes you're doing it as your job but like you shouldn't lose all these other pieces of that and so the group's been really great to kind of remind me um, at the end of the day, like why I'm out here doing this. Um, so yeah, it's been a really great fit. Um, and so that's kind of where I've been all year and, uh, yeah, I'm excited to kind of see what I can keep doing with the group and to keep doing Jonesy, you know, like adjusting is hard going from one training philosophy to another. Um, so I'm hoping like another year of just that consistency and just kind of learning each other, um, is really going to help me, uh, eventually have that breakthrough that I, that I know I'm, I'm waiting to have. Yeah. Fun, I mean, fun fact, I have a poster of him, uh, or had a poster <laughs> of him you? up in my, uh, in my room at my parents' house all growing up, like, you know, I love 20, it. 25 years ago, I had a poster of him and just like <laughs> in, insane, the, the times that he was running back, you know, no super shoes, just no he technology, nothing. Seven. I know. off of he just had water and was running in like Reeboks which (laughs) I mean it's a it's incredible so again like Jonesy is like the epitome of like running is so simple it truly is simple and like yes we're the sport is changing technology we have all this technology we have all this nutrition we have all this like these apps and these watches and all these things that are again are great resources and are helping us push the boundary of what is humanly possible which is awesome but at the end of the day the man ran 207 in the 80s you know like yes. i just like don't like Joni ran 221 in the 80s like yep you just like look at some of these dina ran 219 in like the 90s like you just it's just such a good reminder, like these legends of our sport that have like paved the way for what we're doing now, like looking back at what they've done and being like, it really is like, it's just running. Like it's so simple. And sometimes I think we overcomplicate what is just so simple. And it's just good to kind of remember that, um, that we don't have to have all these things to really go out there and do, uh, what we want to do when you look at what they were doing, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I like, yeah. he's, he's old school. And I think, I think I'm old school at heart. I think I'm in the wrong decade. I think I would have really <laughs> thrived in like the eighties. Um, so again, we get along really well because we just kind of have that similar mentality when thinking about the sport, um, which I, you know, which has been really nice. So, so does that mean he, cause I, I would imagine, you know, especially back then kind of the common training philosophy was just run as much as physically possible and, <laughs> yeah. you know, run, run twice every day as much as physically possible. So was that his approach and like, has he evolved that at all for now how he trains this group or are you a, you know, a high mileage, uh, group as well? No. Kind of a uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not high mileage. Um, like I think the highest I got in my Chicago build was like 95, which for me is quite high given what I've been doing in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, Jonesy, we do, we train, I think similarly to how he trained as far as like the structure of the training goes. Um, but he was doing 
Well, honestly, he actually told me that he really wasn't a high mileage guy that he, okay. he, he ran his best when he topped out at like 90. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So I think we actually do train pretty similarly to how he trained. He's obviously evolved some things and I don't think, you know, we like, he would just run hard like every day. Like, I feel like that's what those guys did. Like they yeah. would just go out for like a 10 mile run and just like, you just run hard. Like you just yeah, kind of ran yeah. for, like whatever. Um, <laughs> So obviously there's, you know, some of that is a little bit different for what we're doing, but yeah, I think we train pretty similarly to how he trained back in the eighties. Um, and we do a lot of the same workouts he did. Um, we do a lot of the same loops that he did in Boulder when he was training here. Um, so it is kind of cool to be like, man, like you're kind of doing what those guys were doing. And, um, they obviously had so much success, uh, doing similar things to what you're doing in that. So, I mean, it's just good confidence. You're like, well, if it worked for him, no, hopefully it works for me. Uh, and again, it's just a simple, a simple way to do it. We do a lot of things off effort. Uh, Jonesy's not one for the watch. Um, <laughs> so we don't do much with paces and things like that, which again, is nice because you're kind of just out there running a little bit more freely, um, which I really like. Um, so yeah, I think he takes a lot of what he did and kind of, retweak some things but essentially that's what we're doing too i would think yeah yeah it's wild the two extremes because <clears throat> in both approaches can work just to, i guess depending on the personality yeah. of the person but it's like there's the one end of i'm gonna wear a heart rate monitor i'm gonna track everything <laughs> i'm gonna take my my lactate levels throughout the workout i'm gonna whatever like all the different things and then yeah then there's the other side of just I know what it feels like to run hard. I'm going to go run hard today. Like you don't, yeah. don't need to overthink it. And, and I think there's, yeah, people have been successful on both sides of it, but it is, totally. it, it just proves that you, you really do need to look at what works for you and what keeps you motivated and not, not necessarily just look at what someone else does and just copy it, you know, word for word totally. or exactly what they're doing. Yeah. That's I mean, again, that's always what I say. I'm just like, that's why running is so cool is because there's so many different ways that you can find success. You just have to figure out what works for you and what works for you may not work at all for someone else. Um, like, you know, I see what like, you know, like Emma Bates does. Um, I could not do what she does. Like, I couldn't train the way that she trains. Like I couldn't do that amount of mileage. Um, the paces she's doing her long runs. Like, I, I just don't know if I could like sustain that. But obviously she has found what has, what works so well for her and yeah. is killing it. Um, you know, and for me, it looks different, but I found success doing it that way. So again, like, that's why you can't compare yourself. Um, and, but again, that's why running is so cool because there's so many different ways to train, um, for the same event. It's just figuring out what that is, finding the right coach that you connect with, finding the right training group that just works and meshes well with you. Um, and so I think that's the beauty of it. And sometimes what works for one part of your career isn't what works for like the other part of your career. Totally. And so I don't think there's anything wrong with transitioning. And I don't think there's anything wrong with people changing groups and changing coaches. And like, sometimes as we evolve and grow as athletes, our needs and training needs to change along with that. Um, but again, that's, what's cool about the sport is it's just like being open to that and, and just kind of figuring out what you need as you kind of progress through it. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Um, all right. Well, we've got a couple of, uh, closing segments here. Um, this one is, this one is special just for you, this first one here. So we, <laughs> with, with the guests that we had leading up to Chicago marathon, we did some trivia questions, uh, oh about, about Chicago. <laughs> oh God. Now, th now this is, we're oh, not gonna, shit. I'm not gonna ask you the same ones. Uh, this is just going to take a different spin on it. So this is trivia about the first ever Chicago marathon, the inaugural event. And we'll see if, see what, see what you know about the Chicago marathon event history. I knew none of these answers before I looked it up. So, you know, no, oh, no shame. I'm already but... so embarrassed. I'm already like, God, <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to do anything. Don't be, don't be. All right. So, so what year was the inaugural, uh, Chicago marathon? Uh, okay. Hang on. Nineteen seventy. <laughs> that seems not, too early. No, that's <laughs> not not too far off. Seventy seven. Oh, so, okay. All right. Yeah, no, I was trying to do quick math in my head, like knowing like what, like, and what was it? Was this? I feel like the forty oh fifth year. I was trying to like do quick math. Uh, I thought this year was like the forty fifth year or forty sixth year because I think their fiftieth is coming up. Oh, Maybe true. Yeah. 
So I was trying to do quick math. Obviously, math was not my strong suit. <laughs> not a math major over here. Did not do that. <laughs> All right. Well, you, hey, you got a couple more to redeem yourself here. So oh God, how, okay. how much do you think it costs to sign up for the very first Chicago Marathon in 1977? What was the entry fee? $25. It was $5. Five dollars. Oh my god! Yes. Oh wow. So if hot deal. Off of that. I Holy know crap, that is a hot deal. You can't register for a turkey trot for five dollars. No, I was going to say a five k's are up to like fifty bucks now if they're giving you a shirt. It's crazy, yeah, you know. I just registered for a turkey trot on Thanksgiving, and I think I paid forty five dollars <laughs> for four miles. What Jeez. you could run a marathon for five. Jeez. We'll never see that again. <laughs> no, not a chance. Not a chance. So, so I guess maybe, I don't know if this helps or not knowing that it was $5, but, but how many runners do you think they got to compete that first year in 1977? I think this year was like 40,000. So you going to go with a hundred. <laughs> yeah. It was actually, this is surprising to me. It was 4,200 in year one. And it was immediately Whoa. out of the gate, the largest marathon that year. Dang. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess a thousand would have been a better guess. I would not have guessed over a thousand though. Wow. No, 4,200 back. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah. It's five bucks. I mean, again, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. So largest marathon right. that year. Cool. Yeah. Largest marathon. And, uh, so then last one on that, how many, or sorry, what do you think the winning times were that first year on the, both the men's and women's side? Oh boy. <clears throat> women I'm gonna god I should know this women I'm gonna say like 245 that's pretty close 250 250 okay 250 yep. men I'm gonna say 218 but basically spot on 217.52 so basically oh, 218 wow, look at yeah. me okay yeah all right so yeah an Indiana native won it on the men's side and a Texan uh woman won the women's side so awesome yeah that's wild. That's a, I mean, that's an impressive first year of the race. I was not expecting that, that when so I looked impressive. it up. No, <laughs> I wasn't expecting any of that. 4,200. That's crazy. I would not have guessed that. Yeah. Man. Yep. Uh, okay. Well, I'll do one more. This is not uh, about the first event, but, but this year, Chicago marathon trivia, how many porta potties were there? And this includes the start finish line area, as well as the porta potties that they put, you know, throughout the course for people to stop at. How many total porta potties do you think there were? I don't know why I want to say like 5,000, but that's what I'm going to go. <laughs> that would be, I mean, that would be nice. It's, it's 1500. So a little oh, bit okay. lower. <laughs> 5, 000, yeah. but, I don't know why in my head. Cause I'm like, okay, if there's like 40,000 runners and there was, yeah, it just seemed, yeah. But yeah, 1500, that's a lot, obviously over a thousand porta potties. I mean, that makes sense, I guess. 5,000. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. That would be, that'd be one like every like, yeah, that'd be a lot. <laughs> be, it would be, it would be nice though. At least, at least would more, be nice. every race could use more porta potties, at least at the start finish line area. Cause those lines, you just look up and down the lines. You're like, why don't they just get like, more porta potties? Nope. Yeah, yeah exactly. I know. I've been to races where there's like one and you're like, whose job was this? Why is there only one? Like you were oh, going to force me to go behind a building. Like they don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, so hopefully someday you can, you know, maybe, maybe being a race director is on your horizon and you can, <laughs> you can yeah, teach everyone how I to have, do it. I right. have good ideas. We need 5,000 porta potties at least. So yeah, maybe, I, maybe that's the direction I should go. <laughs> yeah, I got good get, ideas you'll, for the sport. <laughs> you'll get fired for blowing all the money and them not making enough profit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Awesome. Well, that, that's all the trivia. So now, now we'll just, uh, we'll okay. ask some closing questions to, to learn more about you. So this is one we ask a lot of our guests. I always think it's interesting to see wh which direction it goes. So what would be your dream sponsor and not, it doesn't have to be like a running shoe brand or anything, but like literally if any brand out there doesn't even have to be related to running, who would be your dream sponsor? Um, I really want a hidden Valley sponsorship. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I've reached out to them. I haven't heard anything, <laughs> I haven't heard anything back. Um, so if anyone from Hidden Valley is listening, I would love to be sponsored by you. I'm a huge ranch girl. I put it on literally everything. Um, and I saw this, I think it was just like a joke on Instagram. Um, but it was like, uh, I forget the account, but it was like, they were advertising a, like a ranch goo. 
Like if goo what? made a Hidden Valley flavor and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> that's what I'm missing. That's the flavor <laughs> that I need, obviously. Um, so yeah, Hidden Valley would be like my dream, <laughs> my dream sponsorship. <laughs> wow. Okay. See, that is unique. Very unique. Yeah. But, but I, I, I would say Hidden Valley is probably not marketing much to the athlete persona so no. they could use you to to jump in there and be an ambassador I felt like they could like tap this like whole like new market i feel like i could really bring a lot to the to the company to the brand totally. so i'm gonna try again i might reach back <laughs> i might reach back out just kind of so like, like keep just keep seeing <laughs> yes slide into I, their dms if you doesn't <laughs> hurt doesn't hurt so so what's like the weirdest <laughs> thing that you put ranch on that maybe turns heads because like salad normal pizza normal breadsticks normal like is there some is there some weird thing that you put it on that people are like what are you doing i mean i like put it on all my sandwiches like i don't use mayonnaise like i use ranch instead oh, okay um, fair. like in yeah. grilled cheeses um i don't know i yeah i i like to dip just just about anything in it nothing weird like i'm not like dipping like a snickers bar in ranch like i, I don't i guess i don't go that far with it but like anything savory i feel like you can put ranch on works with um and i was actually at a pizza place um out here in lewisville where i live and uh i asked for a side of ranch because like you said like i can't eat pizza without ranch like and i don't just dip the crust in it like i dip like every both, bite like every like yeah. just every bite <laughs> has to have ranch on it so I asked for a side of ranch and the waiter was like, um, we don't do that here. And I was like, well, you're a pizza place. And they're like, we don't have ranch. Like they were too good for it. Yeah. Um, do you think our pizza like, is so mm. bad that you need ranch on it? Like, yeah, come on. I think he was offended. Like you're going to cover it up. Like this is expensive pizza. Um, but it was like really weird. Like I was weird. It was a weird experience to eat pizza without ranch. I didn't like it. Not a fan. So if I go back to that place, I'm going to just bring my own ranch. Just bring That's your why own. A, goo, a goo ranch would be good. Like you could just, you could just Portable. pocket those. Portable, you know, see, <laughs> I have such good ideas for them. They need they, to bring they me need on. you on so the marketing payroll. That's right. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. right. <laughs> I have a weird obsession with ranch. Obviously that's my dream sponsor, but fun fact about me guys. <laughs> hey, there we go. I mean, I, I see, I definitely see people. I have not seen someone carry their own ranch around, but, uh, but I have seen people do that with like Sriracha bottles or hot sauce oh, or yeah. whatever. They're like, I'm going to take that yeah. everywhere because I put it on everything. So, you well, know, they it's make not like the little bottles, like hidden Valley yep. needs to make like the little ranch bottles. I'd yeah. be set. So there you again, go. there's so many things that they're not capitalizing on. <laughs> All right. Well, well, I'll, I'll blast this, uh, this segment of the podcast to them as well. We'll see cool. if we can push, push Perfect. them on. We'll see if, thank you. I appreciate it. I need some help here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay. How about, uh, what would, what do you typically do to celebrate, uh, a great race or PR? So like, let's say you make the Olympic team, 2024 Olympic oh, trials. Boy. Like what is it? What does a good celebration look like for you after that? Um, <clears throat> I'm a big, like, I love dancing. So I have to incorporate some type of like dance party outing in my celebration. Um, and then I, I owe my go-to is a burger and fries, um, with ranch, obviously on both, uh, and then a beer. Um, I'm also, I also love margaritas and like would eventually work that direction. Um, so there all of go. that burger, fries, ranch, beer tequila and dancing <laughs> is how Sounds... i would celebrate if i make an olympic team or just finally just have that day you know that i know is there uh once i have that day it's you know that's where that's, I'll be all of yep. those things. <laughs> that sounds like a, sounds like a good night to me. Uh, a two yes. follow-ups to that. So what's, uh, what's the type of beer, beer of choice? Um, I don't like IPAs. Um, I like beer that you can put fruit in. So uh, I'm a yep. big like Blue Moon fan, Corona, oh, speaking my uh, language, Pacifico, Modelo. I like all like the Mexican beers. Um, those are kind of like my go-tos. So yeah, I don't, I don't like the heavy stouts or IPAs. Although I, I do weirdly like Guinness. I don't know why it's like random, but I can occasionally put down a Guinness. It just, it just depends. Yeah. It's more of like a fall winter beer, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Man, living in Colorado and not being into IPAs, I don't know. <laughs> you probably it's hard. I are know. You outcast. go to like some breweries <laughs> and you're like, um, what can I order? Like, I'm always like afraid to tell them. They're like, what do you like? And I'm like, I don't want to tell you because I feel like you're going to judge me. I'm like, what do you have that's like a Corona? 
<laughs> just like that girl. <laughs> yes. The, sa- the same girl that asked for ranch to smother the pizza. Oh my, in and- <laughs> I know. I know. This is why we can't have nice things. This is why I can't go places. <laughs> I'm too basic. <laughs> uh, my, my other follow up to that was, uh, what type of music are we, are we dancing to typically? Oh, I, my music taste is kind of everything. Um, but I love, you know, like I love hip hop, love Jay-Z. I love like, like Usher, uh, like Lil John, some of like your classic Classics, like, dance yep. songs. Um, but then I also like, I'm really into MGK right now. Just can't get enough Machine Gun Kelly. So I have that in there. Uh, but those are kind of the ones that I would like dance to. Like, I love country, but like, you can't, can't really like get down to country. For sure. Um, so like when I go out, like I want like the, you know like the Kesha, like, you yeah. know, like some of like the pop, like Katy Perry. Uh, I love Taylor Swift, but again, it just like depends like what you're trying to dance to. Definitely. Um, all the party so, bangers. Yep. All yep. the party bangers. Yeah. I love the party bangers. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> That's all I need for a good night. <laughs> uh, okay. Are you a, are you a coffee person? How, how do you like your coffee? I like my coffee with cream. Um, if I feeling kind of like fancy, I'll even like to put whipped cream into my coffee. Um, but yeah, I like, like, I don't, I'm not a black coffee drinker. For me, the experience is more enjoyable when I like can put like flavoring into it. Like I like the taste of coffee, but I don't drink black coffee. Typically I like to, you know, like to put some cream in there some whipped cream. Um, you know, just kind of play around with it that way. But yeah, I love coffee. I drink it every day. So it's how oh, I start good. my morning. It's like why I get out of bed <laughs> I, <laughs> to have that yeah. cup of coffee. It's like what motivates me most days. Yep. To like ninety nine percent of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you gotta have it. It's how I start every morning. <laughs> uh, give us a well. You kind of said uh, you, you said your post race meal of choice. So how about a pre race meal? What do you typically like morning of the marathon? What are you What are you having before the race? Oh, I um, <clears throat> I always do a bagel and peanut butter and banana. Um. I had a really hard time eating before Chicago. I think I was really nervous. Um, and I was like, tr- I was like, man, try- getting that bagel and peanut butter down was the hardest thing I think mm-hmm. I did all day. Well, outside the last 13 months, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but eating that bagel and peanut butter beforehand was like second to that. It was extremely difficult. I almost didn't get it down, but that's what I always go to. Cause I know it sits well. Uh, yeah. and I- I'm kind of superstitious now cause I've been doing that like literally before every single race, like most of my career. So that's my go-to every time. Yeah. If you don't have stomach issues doing it, no reason to switch it up. If you don't have to, you don't, yeah. Don't fix what ain't broke or whatever. That's right. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Spot on. Uh, What give us a go-to dessert. Oh, I love, um, like baked goods. So I'm a big like cake person. Uh, I love a good, like chocolate peanut butter cake. Uh, I love red velvet. Um, I like the last few weeks before Chicago, I got really into Sonic. Uh, so I liked getting like the, like the milkshakes. Like I love milkshakes. Um, sometimes you just need a good milkshake. You're just like, absolutely. Um, so milkshakes and cake, I guess are like my go-to desserts. (laughs) If I could have anything, that's what I would have. (laughs) That's, that's, I, that's a great combo. I mean, blend, blending up cake Mm -hmm. into shakes is like yes, my favorite have an thing Oreo personally cheesecake shake oh, at sonic and it will change your so life good. so, so good so yeah. good put them together <laughs> <laughs> uh okay I, maybe you've been doing more of this this week i don't know we'll find out but uh give us a netflix show you binged lately that you have have really been digging um <clears throat> so weirdly lately i've been like really into like true crime documentaries So, uh, I binged my last Netflix show that I binged was, um, the Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh yeah. Same. I just watched that like a week um, ago. (laughs) Yeah. Which was horribly dark. And like, while you're watching it, you're kind of like, why am I like giving this guy (laughs) attention given like how horrific he was? But yeah, yeah. I'm obsessed by true crime. I was, I, um, my I majored in criminology um, with sociology at CU. Like I'm just fascinated by like studying people like that 
and why they do what they do and kind of like what the disconnect is obviously. And so anyway, mm-hmm. that was the last one I binged. I binged it in like two days. So after those two days, I was like, whoa, <laughs> like you have got to turn on new girl or like something and like lighten it up. Like that yes. was dark. <laughs> that's a, that that's a dark. hard show to binge. Uh, but yeah, watching that, like watching a few episodes of that before it. bed. I know it's, it's so intriguing, but it's like so hard to then unwind to go to bed after that because it's just but scarring. Yeah, like you have to turn. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to like balance it with something light. So you can kind of like decompress from that. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was the latest thing. And then I'm currently watching The Great British Bake Off um, since there's a new season. But they only release an episode a week. So you can't really like binge that. Um, yeah. But that's what I'm currently kind of like working my way through. I, I did creep on uh, one of uh, the previous podcast episodes you did with Allie and uh, know that you're a Love is Blind <laughs> fan as yes. well. So I think there's a new yes, season of I that. Am. Well, they just had the reunions for the last season oh, and then they yeah, have a new season coming up. So Yeah, they have a new season coming out, but they did a reunion and then they did two, three episodes after the reunion called Love is Blind After the Altar. Yeah. where they like follow like the couples that like made it and some of the other people around to see like what they're all doing now. Um, so I watched that um, a couple weeks ago, like right when that came out. But yeah, I love, I love reality TV trashier, the better. So oh, love yeah. is blind married at first sight, anything on Bravo uh, below deck uh, housewives, like all of that. Um, I'm very selling sunset. Oh, that's a, yeah. Great show. All about yep. that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Love that I, life. I love when all I'm that stuff too. I'm not watching true crime. I'm watching that. It's like, either <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's like what Netflix, Netflix knows that's what people like and that's yes. what they've released. It's like, those are their two that's main large, categories. Yes. <laughs> it's like, what's trending. It's like all these reality shows and then like Jeffrey Dahmer and you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that. Is. So everyone else is also doing what I'm doing. We're just not talking about it. <laughs> yes. People don't want to admit it, but they're doing the same exact thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, speaking of shows, give us a, a favorite childhood show or, or a couple childhood shows that you liked growing up. Oh, I was a big Nickelodeon fan. Oh, that was so the best. I loved um, Hey Arnold, Rugrats, um, SpongeBob, SquarePants, really big fan. Um, yep. So like those types of cartoons. I also like as I kind of got older, I morphed into like the Disney Channel originals um so like sister sister and like some of like the like motocross like one of their disney channel original movies like stuff like that i was like really into (laughs) growing up um but yeah i was a big cartoon fan um early in life so i got sucked into all that stuff absolutely i think that's just like right our i'm just a couple years younger than you but like kind of our age range you know plus or minus five years was all like that was the, those were the years for, for the Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon life Nickelodeon. and then Cartoon Network and Disney too. Uh, both of those just like, yeah, all the shows were good. I, I feel know. like all of them they were hits. They don't make shows like that anymore. No. I feel like that, like that doesn't exist anymore, but yeah, Nickelodeon, some of those shows, classics, classics. Yeah. Man, I, I'm gonna have to find find those again for uh, for my daughter in the in the next yes. few years. Like, what what's gonna be her her network or her shows that Dude, she bring watches? Bring some Nickelodeon back. Give her I know, some Rugrats. I know. That's such a good show. I, I, I want to go back I'm and binge about that. It now. Yes, so do I. I'm kind of like, where can I find that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. I'll, I, I just, yeah. Hope, hope, uh, hope she's into that because I would totally watch all of that stuff again with her. So oh, yeah. Yeah. No, bring her into the fold. That's all. Those were all, those were the heyday of like That's all the right. good stuff, you know, that was it. So early nineties. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, all right. Well, this is the beer mile podcast. So we have to ask, have you done a beer mile before? I haven't. Um, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I've never done one. I want to do one because I just want to like know what I could do. But this is my problem. I'm a terrible, like I can't chug beer. I, I struggle greatly. Uh, could never really shotgun a beer that well. So that's where I feel like I'm really going to struggle. Um, and then also just running the laps, like the last two laps after doing that. I just, I don't know. But I think I could do a sub 20 minute beer mile. Like I'm setting the bar like there. I feel like that's, that's, Knowing like what like world records are, which are like five. What is it now? Is it under five now? So for for women, it's six sixteen, and for men, it's four twenty eight. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So given that, I'm like, you're definitely not going to do that. You're not in that ballpark. Uh, but I think I could do like sub twenty, sub fifteen, maybe. Um, so one of these days, I need to try. I've wanted to. I've just the opportunity has not really presented itself. 
Um, but maybe I should just make that happen. Maybe that's what I should do on this break. Maybe I should finally just pick that off and I'll, and then I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a good, it's a good team bonding, you know, thing to yeah. do. I, it's like, it's always like a club, your, your running club team or I don't know, or yeah. your college team, whatever. That's like typically the setting yeah. that you would do it in. So yeah, you just got to get a couple other people who are, you know, taking a little break from running to hop over the track and do it with you and you can all suffer together. Yeah. That's the best way to, yeah, that's the best way to do it. <laughs> but, yeah. You need to suffer with other people. Yeah. I don't want to go like do it by myself. That like makes me sad so i'm like yeah i definitely want other people out there (laughs) so i'll have to recruit some people and finally do it so yeah i'll put that on my goal list um of things i need to get done I think you have the right mindset too. You have the right mindset of, you know, most people underestimate going in and then they are like, oh, easily could do seven minutes or whatever. And then they get into beer number two and they're like, no, I can't do it anymore. So you have the right mindset. You only can over deliver off of what you've uh, set your expectation at. Running a 618 mile like by itself is like relatively difficult. So I'm like, 618 while chugging beer in between i'm like no no you know thyself laura that's like not where you need to start <laughs> like no respect it respect the game <laughs> Oh man. Awesome. Well, it has been a pleasure having you on. Uh, we typically ask our guests to close out with some like words of wisdom or advice or whatever, but I feel like that's what you gave us the whole episode. So I mean, <laughs> I say, you know, you don't, you don't like owe me, you don't owe me anything at this point. Like, honestly, you've given good advice across the board, but I don't know. Is there any, anything you want to plug or uh, closing remarks or any, anything else that you want to say, even, even a joke or I don't know, whatever the floor, the floor is yours to close it out if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I don't I mean I feel like I covered most of what I would normally say um but I guess I'll just close it out with uh there's a thousand different ways to get somewhere um and like when in doubt just always remember your why perfect perfect concise and very true great <laughs> great message yeah. I love it that's like the spark note version of basically what I talked about the whole episode. So if we'll people just, just oh. yeah, we'll just release that, that quote and the rest of the episode, we can just get rid of it because yeah. it's not important. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. And who is this? This is Biggie. Hi, bud. Yeah. Oh, hi. Man. I know. Yeah. This is my dog, Biggie. He's a six year old shepherd mix. My boyfriend and I adopted him three years ago. Okay. Um, and he's the light of our lives. Oh, <laughs> looks like a, looks like the goodest boy out there. <laughs> He's a good boy. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. I enjoyed the conversation. It always, it always flies by. Uh, I could have kept talking to you forever, but, but thanks so much. And yeah, best wishes on this downtime. Just really enjoy it. And uh, we'll be following along with whatever you got going next. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. I had a blast. I was honored you reached out. So yeah, thank you. No, pleasure is all ours. Thank you so much. And there you have it. Thanks for tuning in to this conversation, y'all. If you want to support the show, you can take two seconds and leave us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple. You can also hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel, Beer Mile Media. We also put the podcast out there. And then, of course, you can support us by supporting our sponsors. You can use our code BEERMILE20, that's BEERMILE20, all one word at athleticbrewing.com to get award-winning NA Craft beers delivered right to your door. You can also use code BEERMILE, all one word, at manscaped.com for all of your male grooming, hygiene, and confidence needs. And lastly, but not least... You can get the best sunglasses in the game at knockaround.com. Use our code BEERMILEPOD, all one word, for 20% off. Thank you for the support. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one.